Uh, Civil Shepherd. Banter. Banter, banter. Banter, banter, banter. Banter. <laughs> banter. Yes, banter. Banter. Oh, oh banter. there's there's the music. You hear the music playing in? <laughs> now there it is. Right over our intro banter. Imagine, <laughs> imagine that. Uh, so we're well, not bantering? Yeah, I think okay. I think the banter is banter banter. Okay. Banter? Yeah. All right. Well, then, in that case, welcome to the Video Reformation Podcast. I'm Ben Oliver. I'm Justin Plant. We're the co-founders of Storyboard Media and your guides to practicing effective video for business. We're like the Dumbledore to your Harry Potter, you muggle. Uh, before we jump into our topic today, which is something along the lines of setting up your video team for success, mm -hmm. uh, a little housekeeping first. Keep those topics uh, coming. Uh, we're much we just more put a list together. Our, we, yeah, we did just put a list, list we're together. We're good. We, we don't, don't need, need any We help. don't need your suggestions. It's been too, um, too time-consuming to actually go through all of them. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's something we've given off to David. Yeah. Uh, Inside to manage. Jokes. <laughs> Inside jokes. Um, it's okay because the only people who listen to this are our employees. Are inside. When he edits people. it and when David. And, and when David <laughs> approves it. Yep. Um, all right. Well, I understand um, another housekeeping note. We have a new sponsor this week. Sure do. Very excited about this one. Um, I don't know much about it yet. Um, just because it's not out. They haven't launched. But sure. um, I thought it was because you were still writing it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it is Dead Wrong Podcast. Dead Wrong Podcast. Okay. Yeah. Um, is that a spinoff of this one? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, Same group, though. Same all group. right. Dead Wrong Podcast. Um, great. Yeah. Full spot later in the episode, yeah, I imagine? Definitely. Good. Okay. Well, let's get on to our topic of the day, setting up your video team for success. Um, what do we mean by that? Well, uh, a number of our uh, listeners have are either part of a, an internal team, like 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 we said, Red Hat before, just as a local example. Mm -hmm. um, have a great studio. Um, making sure that those teams have what they need to to succeed. <laughs> so I just reformatted the uh, what uh -huh. you said there. Yeah. No, but um, I think it's it's easy for us to to base that off of what we think makes effective video. Right, which are the seven phases. Right. And we have kind of structured it around that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, what do we mean by that? I think, so So when I was outlining some of these things, I tried to put myself in the position of kind of a marketing manager, um, maybe VP of marketing, VP of content, something like that where I wasn't necessarily hands-on involved in the production of video content, but I was responsible for uh, its impact, if its efficacy, uh, it, it helping, you know, uh, what our overall marketing goals are. Um, and so I just kind of pictured myself as, as that person with either uh, an agency that they work with or, um, or an in-house team. Mm -hmm. And what things could I make sure that I could do to to give them the best chance to make something that's going to work for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I imagine I imagined this episode being for again those kind of VPs of content, director mm -hmm. of content, those kinds of people. Yeah, this is this episode is going out in late October of 2020. So uh, because video for business is is still pretty new. I think a lot of the stuff is evolving and changing. So it's probably, there's probably some new stuff in here that a lot of managers don't know about. Yeah. And in a year we could probably redo this with some new, you know, some new material because it is changing pretty quickly. And it's not just about the equipment. It's about the whole ecosystem of how, you know, where videos are seen and um, how analytics are collected and all that kind of stuff too. So if we're going to base this on the seven phases, why don't we give um, our uh, maybe our new listeners uh, an introduction to the seven phases. Sure, we structure it as a pyramid, which I'm right now imagining is somewhere in this area. Yep. Um, on the bottom layer, <laughs> we have uh, we have strategy. So that's the, the the foundation of this pyramid. It's the most important part because every other step, the six remaining steps or phases, are uh, basically an execution of that strategy. So um, starting with strategy, and then our next layer, thank you, Vanna, is uh, typically what a lot of people think of when they think of video. It's pre-production, production, and post-production. So it's the thinking of 
the shooting or animating and then the editing of that content. Okay. So at this point, we've actually got video created. You have video. Yep, you have a, a video or videos or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Next step, you want to make sure it gets out there and people can see it. So there's distribution and promotion. Um, slight, there's a, there's a nuance to that, but basically distribution is getting it into places where people can find it, mm-hmm. like putting it on your website or whatever, <clears throat> and promotion being more about getting it in front of targeted people. And um, sometimes that costs money, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a gray area. We're still feeling our way around in terms of like hashtags or whatever. Um, And then on top of that, uh, analysis. So um, looking at the the efficacy, the the results of that video content, um, has it made a difference? Have you achieved your purpose? What else did you find out? And, um, And I guess, the, the next step is just the circular pattern of, of going back to strategy and applying those um, those learnings to to your next round of strategy. It's a vicious cycle. We got to find a better, like, because. Like a pyramid on a pyramid? <laughs> turtles all the way down. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. So those are the seven phases of practicing effective video for business. Um, so let's go back to strategy. The way that I put this in the, in the notes here is to identify a firm purpose for each of your videos and, and better yet, a comprehensive strategy. So at the very least, be able to hand off to your in-house team why we're making this video. Mm-hmm. Like, what is it supposed to do? Um, I need this video to increase our MQLs. I need this video to... Um, give us a, a 12% brand lift on YouTube. I, those kinds of, I mean, it can be broad, it can be specific, um, but what are we really trying to accomplish with that, this? Because that's the kind of thing that you could hand off to a talented video team and let them do what they specialize and figure out how to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not your job in, in one of those higher roles to necessarily give step-by-step like, peanut butter and jelly sandwich level instructions mm-hmm. it's about uh that that's an evan thing that was in a conversation that was in david's oh, okay. and my conversation with evan last week but it's not about like the step by step here's what you need to do it's here's what needs to be accomplished mm-hmm. you guys figure out how to best do right that. and that's why you hire people to do things <laughs> yeah um so at the very least a purpose and then you know if you can give them a comprehensive strategy that's more along the lines of like here's the purpose right here's the strategic concept a Mm -hmm. video that does this Mm -hmm. um want it for maybe these personas that we've already identified you know so our our jill persona our jake persona and our alexandra persona Mm -hmm. um because you know about those personas and and how they like to be communicated with And, Mm -hmm. and again that's information that that the video team could then craft scripts and delivery and those kinds of things tailored for those personas. And even like certain audiences are going to watch video in different places where we don't watch TV really like a t- traditional television programming. Um, but we do watch Hulu, you know, streaming services. So we our audience uh, like, or people like us may not watch video for people like them or them. Mm-hmm. And so knowing where a lot of that stuff is going to be shown, there are certain restrictions placed on the type of video content, um, whether it's the content itself or how long it is or the type of video, like the the format, mm-hmm. um, the file types, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so all that stuff, uh, all that stuff helps draw some some shapes and circles around what you should be creating. Now, do you think? Uh, Ooh, topic idea. Uh huh. How to Put create a document. creative brief? Oh, that would how be fun. How to put together a creative brief? Yeah. Somebody write that down. Wait, let me add it to the doc. Um, do you think that the, so this fictitious marketing manager that you are in this scenario, is that something that you need to do, build that strategy with your team? Or is that something you need to do with the executives? Like where where does that responsibility fall and who's involved? I would, um, the way that I run my organization, my fictitious organization, um, I, I probably know from the executives what they want me to accomplish, so mm-hmm. I don't need to Im- involve them in creating 
um, kind of any roadmap for my specific content. They don't probably want to be in the weeds that much. Sure. They just know that I'm going to do my best to You're responsible get for my teams to create stuff that does this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. Um, but the more that I can, in, can involve my creation production team in those strategic endeavors, they may provide insights um, depending on who's doing the analysis of other content that we have, who's it could be across the marketing team, which of our blog posts, which of our social posts have had a lot of engagement and gotten a lot of positive reaction. Mm-hmm. Those could give us strategic ideas for video content. Mm-hmm. Um, so the more that you can kind of get that input, ultimately, I do think it is your responsibility to be the captain and say, this is the path we're going to mm-hmm. go down. Yep. Um, but the more that you can rely on the people who are who are kind of in this content day by day, you're going to get a better sense of, of ideas of, of what type of stuff is working, yep. what you can do more of what isn't working. So do less of that, uh, those kinds of things. Yeah. If it were your fictitious company and you were in this fictitious role, would you do anything differently? I, Not really. I mean, I think the more information you can bring to those meetings, the better off you're going to be, or, or at least to that decision-making process of here's what the strategy is. So, yeah, you might want uh, your your videographer or shooter or whatever in the room. You may want your editor in the room because every, eventually everybody needs to work together to create that piece um, and being able to say, well, hey, I don't know how to do animation. Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, then, okay, well, we're not doing animated videos. <laughs> uh, it's not within our, our capabilities. Or uh, we know that we'll need to use budget to find someone <clears throat> who can't. Mm-hmm. Or why would this be animated in the first place? I think that's this what is we're going to talk about. <laughs> yes, and I'm validating your point. <laughs> okay. Um, but I do also want to set up our, our likely next episode, which is form following function. Mm-hmm. See, this is what happens when we plan episodes. Oh, man. We can tease future episodes. Yeah. In present episodes. Mm-hmm. So maybe it Such doesn't a tease. need to be animated. Okay. <laughs> but then, yeah, like like your writers and stuff or your whoever's in charge of the analytics of like your traffic and where, where your audience is. Digital strategist, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Those, um, all those people can help inform that decision-making process. So. Analyst? An analyst? Is that it? I think is that's that, what it is. Yeah. How it's yeah. pronounced? I've yeah. always wanted to be an analyst. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what else in the, in the strategic part uh, foundation? What would you want to create to hand off to your team to, to set them up for success? Timelines? Yeah. Like as a goal, like yeah. it needs to be done by X, whether yeah. that's because of an event that's happening or a new site that's launching or, or whatever it is. Or a... a an integrated digital campaign that's launching that this needs to be a part of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Budget. Yeah. I I think there's like, there's a couple places where we actually have budget in here, but, but you do want to plan that out as early as, as possible. So the more you, you get a sense of, of what you can provide your team, um, you know, or, or again, depending on how the team's structured, maybe you say, this is the budget for, you know, producing this thing and promoting this thing. And so, you know, someone has to make a decision on how much they want to set aside for a promotional budget, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. But I think we can get deeper into budget in each of these specific uh, areas, probably. And uh, this may sound silly, but it is important is what are the deliverables? Yeah. Uh, that can often be overlooked. And at the end, you've got one video and someone's like, I, I expected a promo cut and a thumbnail and all this stuff and, and an animated gif to put into our email yeah and, and then and then they're like well oh shit but it's due today so I, mm-hmm. whoops well and it could be and, and that's why you know again if you're going outside of purpose with more of a comprehensive strategy even if you're letting your team know that this is going to be part of an email campaign then then the team could be proactive enough to think, all right, well, we probably sure. want an animated gift. So you, depending on the team, you may not necessarily have to dictate, again, every step. But but if they can, if they know that it's going into a MailChimp campaign, they can probably kind of project forward that we may need a special asset mm-hmm. for, for mm-hmm. that. Or they may need to create a landing page yep. um, or have someone on the web team create a landing page to direct people to that out of the email, whatever. Yeah. Um. All right, why don't we move on to pre-production? One of my favorite quotes is that 90% of a director's job is done before the shoot, Mm -hmm. Um, which which really 
uh, w- which was actually a quote from a a relatively well known commercial director, um, and uh, I think so often, especially companies that are new to video, they want to just jump into on set mm-hmm. and and shooting and and all of those things. But you've got to give your time your, your your team the appropriate amount of time for pre production. Um, because there is a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of decisions that need to be made. Um, when, when we really think about pre-production, we're talking about how do we take this strategic initiative? How do we take this purpose? I need a video that does X. And the first thing someone's going to have to figure out is how do you creatively turn that into a concept? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's, I don't think that's something that can be taught. Um, that's that's something that that you just have to have someone who's got a certain amount of creative curiosity, um, who's willing to figure out or able to figure out how to accomplish something in a creative way mm-hmm. or multiple creative ways, um, and then present among the team and and figure out all right here here's the best way that we you know we can fulfill this purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, once you've got that creative concept, now you're thinking okay well you know what does this look like? What does this sound like? What does it feel like? What do we want people to think? feel and do um, during this video, after this video. Um, what's the script going to be? Mm-hmm. Uh, is this a hosted video? Is this a VO-driven video? That may or may not be part of the creative concept. Is this uh, animated? Is it live action? Is it doc style? Is it scripted? Um, all of those decisions that then need to be made, but each of those decisions should be grounded in the purpose of the video. Mm-hmm. So it may be that that somebody really wants to improve their animation chops, but because this is a lower in the funnel social proof um, mm-hmm. type video, that lends itself probably more to case study, customer story, you know, testimonial type thing. Yep. And so we want to get actual customers and actual users on camera to you know show that social proof. So it may not. Again, if we get you know if somebody says, "Here's my animation pitch for this." But the purpose is to to kind of you know share that social proof. You might actually lose an element of authenticity with that creative approach. Mm-hmm. So somebody's got to be there to to kind of make those decisions also. And, I, and I'm all for you know multiple suggestions coming in and deciding which direction to go, as opposed to the team comes back with just one proposal yeah. saying, "Here's what's going to happen." Mm-hmm. So time is an important element, especially here because. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Of course, you can always do, well, not always. Some, sometimes you can do a reshoot if you're lucky enough to yeah, have that. Um, that but always costs more money and time than you think it does. Um, so that is, if you're going to spend time, this is the place to do it. What about tools? What kind of tools are helpful in this part of the process? A ball-peen hammer to hit people over the head with. Mm-hmm. Yep. Stuff. Yeah, I prefer to bang my head into a wall. Mm-hmm. I heard that burns calories. Yeah. <laughs> um, tools. I, I. I mean, there's there's collaboration tools. Um, there's uh, organization tools like production based organization tools like Studio Binder. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You know, to plan out shoots Where you can and do storyboards and schedule, storyboard, shot build lists. a crew, uh, all those kinds of things. Um, I'm so, yeah. You know, a project management platform is probably necessary just to keep all the pieces um, going. Mm-hmm. Um, what about like script writing? Like are those- s- script writing. I mean, there's there's as we talked about in the last episode about writers. I mean, there's uh, there's Final Draft, there's Celtex, um, and those will you know put into script format. But there's also a Google Docs plugin that will put into script yeah. format if if you know what that stuff is. Um, Oftentimes, uh, before you put it into that format or, or between that format and, and shooting, you put it into like an AV script or a shooting script. Mm-hmm. We honestly do that with Google Sheets. Um, yeah. We'll go from a Google Doc to a Google Sheet just to kind of organize that out. So you don't really need any special tools um, for that. There are budgeting softwares that are available, but so often are just for big like film productions. Yeah. And those aren't necessary, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. It's just whatever you can, you know, keep yourself organized in and, and kind of give access to the people that you need to give access to, to be honest. Do you have more? Um, of course I got more. <laughs> well, then finish, because I, I, I was going to move to a uh, another bullet point. 
Well, I, I was actually going to go. So, you know, at, at this point, kind of running through, you know, maybe we've got um, a pass at a script now after we've got the concept. Mm -hmm. So we're taking a pass at the script or scripts, and, and then we still have to figure out, um, well, who do we need to cast for this? And then we've got to go through the casting process. Um, I think that's another part of giving your, your team resources for production is give them a budget for actors. Um, we've talked many times um, about about companies that, that think they're going to save so much money by using non-actor employees when all it really costs is $300, $500, $700 a day for a talent to come in and you're going to get a 10x better performance mm -hmm. um, and you're not going to have to reshoot anything or have, you know, kind of a garbage in, garbage out. You'd think, you know, after casting, there's locations that, I mean, there's just so much that goes into pre-production that and, and we've got i think a full episode or two on pre-production mm -hmm. all the decisions that have to be made and that's why all of this stuff has to happen before the shoot because it's it's really wasting an entire crew even if it's just your in-house team it's it's wasting a day of their time if you're figuring all this stuff out once you're on set getting all that stuff ready before you're actually going to go shoot even if you're just setting up a shoot in your conference room is just fundamentally important yeah I mean, those are things that you can, some of the, sometimes those decisions are made as simple as like going down a checklist and like, yep, conference room, this, yep. uh, this person. But, you know, don't forget to reserve the conference room. Don't forget to reserve buffer time before it for setup and after for mm -hmm. teardown. Make sure that, uh, you know, if there are um, announcement speakers in there that they're turned off or music that plays in the office, make sure that speaker's turned off. HVAC, if or you refrigerators. Know, all, HVAC control, all those kinds of things are things that you just need to make sure ahead of time are taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, and then what kind of people or skills are necessary during this part of the process? Well, I think regardless of the people that you have, bringing storyboard media into your project <laughs> is a fantastic decision at this time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, I, I think that honestly depends on on who you've got on your in-house team. Do you have one person who's there as kind of your videographer, mm -hmm. um, and you may need to bring in a writer for that person? Um, do you have some really good content writers who you can train up to be script writers on staff? Then maybe those are people you could just pull from, you know, somewhere else in the marketing team. Actors. Um, you know, again, what, what are the talents that your in-house team has? Because you need you need writing, you need lighting, you need audio, you need camera, you need. Um, well, you're skipping ahead a little bit to production. Edit. Well, yeah, I'm 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 also thinking about just like making sure that these people are all involved and set up mm -hmm. before. Yeah. So you that, do. Like, I, I mean, I was thinking about the talent involved. Yep. Like to make this thing, I need to prepare this entire team of mm -hmm. people. And whatever holes I can fill with my in-house team, uh, whatever I've got left over, I've got to go outside the organization. To find. Right. Or my team has to go outside the organization to find. Yeah. Like, I think the, the, some of the most important pieces here are someone well, who ha who's able to accomplish the producer role. So, like, project-oriented, uh, making sure that stuff is in place, um, that, like you said, you've got the actors, you've got the location, all that stuff. You've got to have the director someone who can maintain a vision of what this is supposed to be and how, you know, what we're trying to do. Um, and then, uh, that's like, that doesn't necessarily always mean the creative person either. <laughs> like well, so that, that's like, interesting. Cause I was just going to say, and that's probably best if it's the person who came up with the creative dream. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be, I mean, sometimes it could be, it could be that kind of shooter editor person that you've got on staff. Um, but oftentimes the person who came up with a vision is the best person to execute that, that vision. And maybe that means that they don't know anything about a camera or lighting or whatever, but they, they have that vision that they put together for that treatment that, that at least if they, if they know how to work with that team and trust the camera operator to capture the shots they want to, and the, then you know, that's the person I, again, if I were running this fictitious team, the person who came up with the creative ideas, the person I'd want directing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's all one person. Yeah. Which, that I means that's how you and I both started too. Yeah. You learn how to do all this stuff yourself. Individually, not together. I mean, that, right. that, like we were both just the only person. And then we were both so relieved to have somebody 
to work with mm -hmm. on something the first time we ever worked together. Like, oh, it's so nice to have someone who knows how do you, how audio works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or or just had two more lights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Oh, good. I could put a hair light yeah. on this thing now. Um, yeah, it's funny. Uh, it, it's funny how creative you get when you don't have the resources. Mm -hmm. But then how much easier the job is when you do have and the And usually a resources. better outcome yeah. when you have specialists on, on, yeah. on board. Yeah. But any business knows that, you know, you've got only, you've got finite resources and you have to make do. Yeah. And, and, and depending on the amount of video content you're going to make, um, you've got the decision between buying equipment and renting equipment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you, if you've got a team and, and maybe the primary video person is also responsible for social media content. So it's not a full-time job, then maybe you just want to rent gear mm -hmm. um, and not make a big commitment um, to owning that stuff. But if, if you want to, you know, want that team cranking out consistent content on a regular basis, then it's just going to very quickly be more cost effective for you to own that gear as opposed to renting that gear week over week mm -hmm. over week. Um, you know, and you can also start by renting, understand, you know, how much that costs and quickly realize, OK, well, this is a piece that we should own. Yep. Uh, now kind of sliding into production, which is mm -hmm. fine, because this is all like at some point it all starts to fade <laughs> together. What, yeah. Except for the fact that when you hit record, you're actually <laughs> in production. And yeah, no longer we, we, in -production. yeah, we haven't actually set up a camera or a light yet. Right. It's, it feels different when it's animation based. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to say what production technically is. If it's creating some of the still, st you know, style frames, is that production or is that still creative? That like we'll have an episode on that and, and dig more into it with somebody who does that day in and day out every single day. Yeah, that's upcoming in our uh, types of video series <laughs> right. animation coming soon because we're planning now. So let's assume a live action sure. shoot. Let's even go with the conference room idea. Maybe we're doing a series of ugh, subject matter expert or, or yeah. subject matter experts or. Um, or 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 oh, customers are coming into your office yeah. and and you know it's, they're in town. It's called so an interview, like yeah. It's called an interview of some kind. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah, I think we already kind of started this conversation with the gear. There's the rent versus own. There's the you know there's certainly a lot of content that is uh, executable on an iPhone, sure. Um, but you know how how broad an audience is this going to reach? Um, where in the funnel are they? Where in the funnel are they? How how much of a uh, an impact do you need to make a, a visual impact? Do you need to make? Does this need to be well polished? If it's high, I, I think the higher in the funnel it is, the more polished it needs to be. And as you get down to the lower funnel stuff, which is people who've already basically decided. Like, this is something I could totally use. Now I just need to make the decision to actually go for it over something else or mm -hmm. what I'm currently using or whatever the situation is. Um, that can be more more gritty. Um, you know, that can be more personal. That can be um, less production value because it's more of a... It's much closer to one-to-one -one messaging yeah. than something at the top of the funnel, which is one to so many. Mm -hmm. It's just got to reach a certain standard because your brand is kind of on the line yeah. there. Yep. Um, so, you know, if these are, and if these are interviews and let's say that they are customer stories, uh, you know, a lot of people think those are top of funnel things, but I firmly believe they're lower in the funnel type content. So you could probably get away with more, but you know, basic three point interview lighting, um, someone who, you know, we've done an entire episode on how to do good interviews. Mm -hmm. um, uh, relatively recently, um, there's a lot of, of preparation that goes into, uh, into crafting the right questions and understanding what that story is that you want to get out. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have the right person there to, to, um, to ask those questions and to have that conversation. And I think a lot of organizations find that it's hard to find the right person to do that. I mean, we've worked with plenty of clients where where the person that we're working for um, just assumes that they're the right one to be asking the interview questions, and yet they have never done it. Make zero effort to make the subject feel comfortable mm -hmm. because they've never done it, or because of their personality, or or because of whatever. So there's 
you know, there's there's so much to making an interview subject feel comfortable that that you almost I mean, if the questions are prepared properly, you could almost put anybody in that chair to ask the questions. If there's someone who's who's good at, you know, conversation, small talk, yeah, those, yeah. those kinds of things. The things that our team desperately needs for this type of, you know, for for production, um, they need a place too. So we've got a, whether that's a studio in house or that is a quiet conference room, mm-hmm. or sometimes we've even rented an office for a day at like a, a, a we spaces work or, or a we work uh, yeah. or something like that, um, just so that we could get a a different location that looks nice and has some cool, you know, scenery. It's not this wallpaper. <laughs> Um, 1973 grass wallpaper <clears throat> yeah with paint um, which is available for rent <laughs> um, and I bet WeWork was happy for the revenue also <laughs> like ooh $300 yeah I don't think we paid them um, I mean I don't think they charged us actually <laughs> <laughs> that's better yeah um, but you know that's the thing too is is uh, oftentimes the assumption is that a location is going to be expensive but, you know, for somebody like a WeWork that's got the space, I mean, make the call. See if you can get access to the space without having to, you know, pay anything. We've shot in my better. house before. We've shot in your apartment before. Yeah, yeah. Because we wanted an exposed brick or because we wanted a home feel. Yeah. You got. You probably have to help them get the space. Um, and, well, and I think studio is worth discussing, too, a little bit more. I think that goes back to kind of the volume of content you're going to be creating. If you're a big enough company, you've probably got a storage closet or a conference room or um, an unused office or corner of an office that you could convert into Mm -hmm. a studio. If again, you're going to be creating a consistent amount of content on a regular basis, why not dedicate that space? And, and Wistia has got a great tutorial on how to convert an existing office space into um, a, a, a small studio. Um, and that's actually one um, one of the videos that they learned. We, we talk so often about looking at your analytics and understanding which parts of videos people are watching. Mm-hmm. They learned that, that they needed to put together their um, in-office studio how-to video because they looked at the analytics on one of their behind-the-scenes video and they saw everybody stopping and reminding and looking at like mm-hmm. the basic lighting setup as they were walking by the open door. And so they were able to kind of glean from that that people were pausing on that to see where were the lights, how were they suspended, how were they positioned, how many lights were there, whatever. And then their how to create an office studio became like their biggest viewed uh, video. And that was just that insight that they gleaned from part of a behind the scenes video mm-hmm. uh, that people were watching a lot. Um, so, you know, you've got space or, or even if you've got a smaller office, you know, may- maybe there's other space in the office building that isn't being used that the landlord would be willing to, you know, mm-hmm. rent it at a reduced mm-hmm. rate or something like that. I yep. mean, there's all kinds of ways to get creative about how to do that. Uh, maybe there's a local video agency who's got a small studio not far from your office and you can rent that on a regular basis. There's also a lot of states have a locations based website where like for filming, mm-hmm. specifically for filming and sometimes yep. their homes, office buildings, whatever. Um, it's usually there's like a, there's usually a department in the state like the NC Film Commission or something mm-hmm. like that. Yep. Okay. So now we've recorded this thing. Yep. Um, and let's move on to to post production. Um, I think time is a big thing here. Stuff can be turned around pretty quickly, but you want to be able to have some some back and forth among the team, some kind of feedback rounds. Um. I think depending on how your team's set up, you could let them have some kind of internal rounds and get to a point that they wanted to show to you mm-hmm. as a manager. And then I think the biggest thing that you can do for your team in that post-production process, honestly, is being timely and constructive with your feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, don't sit on it for three days and then get to it and then... Expect to turn around. Of- yeah, and then you know, know that it's due next day or right. whatever. Um, take the time takes less time than you think watch it make your notes and share your notes um i believe we covered feedback in much more detail in the how to be a good client episode Mm -hmm. um but i think my biggest takeaway for for any client or anybody doing any kind of feedback is to um note 
problems as opposed to offering solutions. Mm -hmm. Um, It's the video team's job to find the best solution. um, And they can do that if you say... um, Yeah, give us an example of of bad and then good. Bad feedback would be um, switch out the shot at a minute and 23 seconds. Mm -hmm. Um, Or... Replace the shot at 123 with something that some B-roll of, with uh, some B-roll or with one of those drone shots or, or mm-hmm. whatever. Why is that bad? That's bad because, well, that's bad because it's worse than the good. The good would be, I don't like that I'm in the shot at 123, mm-hmm. right? Or um, I don't. Um, that shot at 123 has a VP who's actually um, leaving the company mm-hmm. in a week. Mm-hmm. Don't tell anyone. Mm-hmm. So we don't want her in the video. Um, so if, if I'm telling the team what to do without telling the team why I want it done, you're restricting their options at, at a replacement basically. Mm -hmm. And so if you were just to tell the team, we need to take out the shot at 123 because blank, then they can maybe put in one of their favorite shots that they didn't get to put in because it didn't really fit that you didn't know about that, that you didn't even know about. That, that they thought that, you know, it was important to have that shot in there. Now that they know that that shot shouldn't be in there, maybe there's something that helps the storyline or whatever that they really wanted to put in mm-hmm. um, that's just going to make the piece better. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons that you aren't aware of at this time as to why each of those shots were selected and what didn't go into that shot. Maybe taking out that person changes up. Maybe you didn't even realize that that person was also in another shot, and the editor recognizes that. Sure. So they're able to say, well, do I need to take out the shot at so-and-so? And that gives them maybe an opportunity to move things around, and it opens up great ideas. So it's just, it, it, it's, I, I get that people's instinct is to, is to provide a solution, but if you're not a video expert, just state what your issue is with a certain mm-hmm. thing. And leave it at that and let the people who are the experts figure out the best thing mm-hmm. to, to put in there. So for me, post-production is basically about feedback. What about you? Timely and specific. Timely and specific, like, constructive and, yeah, constructive. you know, problems, not solutions. Mm-hmm. I mean, just kind of going off of the, the structure we've, we've been using, they need some, in an ideal world, that person would have... Actually, I, I think this is where deadlines at really help because mm-hmm. you're forced to make decisions to, to get something done in a certain amount of time. If you know that your color correcting is going to take two hours, then you have to have this part done by here, which means you have to have the first draft, blah, blah, blah. In an ideal world, um, they've got a really fast machine with great hard drives um, mm-hmm. yeah. for, for editing Yeah, um, and a dark, quiet room where they can do the editing because if no I... No humidity. Low humidity. Yeah, is that for the computer or for you? Yeah. Uh, Ben and I spent a lot of time in some dark rooms. (laughs) In in a ten by ten dark room, no air, no ventilation, and uh, guess what? It smelled like the combination of the two of us really quickly. Uh, Big screens can help you see the detail of, of the piece a lot more, and it's not just about seeing the video. It's about all of the tools and instruments that help you edit that video. That you need to see that is so intricate. Um, if you've got a two minute long video, I'm not gonna do the math, but that's a shitload of frames. Mm-hmm. And each frame, you need to make a decision, it, essentially make a decision on each frame. Does this go in, does it not go in? What do I like about that? What do I not like about it? Um, and being able to expand and contract those timelines and see well, everything and, and on, in detail. If it's an interview, if you're gonna make a 90 second, two minute video, you're still probably cutting down from 45 minutes, an hour of conversation. Could be, yeah. I mean, that takes, I mean, that takes time to review. It takes time to do paper edits if that's the approach you want to do. I mean, so, you know, that could even be a budget thing. Budget for transcripts, to do paper edits. <clears throat> yeah, transcripts are, especially in this example, yeah. Well, and and I think time to focus and and not constant distractions, mm-hmm. right? So if you, if you can't, I mean, if they still have to work in a cubicle, for example, at least making sure that you respect the time that they're going to block out to that. Because once you, once you break that zone, it's so hard to get, I mean, you know, I think the typical numbers are like for every interruption, it takes up to 15 minutes to get back to the level of focus you were at before you were interrupted. Um, You know, so, so 
make sure that they're blocking off their editing time on the calendar and, and really respect that. Don't don't walk by the cubicle and, and chat them up. Don't, you know, invite them to a meeting. Don't, you know, ask them for something else uh, yeah. during that time. I was in a, pretty much the situation I was working because uh, I, I used to be in sales. I was still in the sales area, which was always loud and rowdy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was in a cubicle situation. Um, I said, I have to go home to edit this. And they let me, which was good because I, yeah. I got a lot more work done, a lot more focused. Okay, so was, now we've got a video, right? We have, uh, yeah, we have a video. A video or videos? Mm-hmm. I'd like to discuss what we do um, to set our team up for success after. after they've made the video once we hear from our sponsor. Perfect. Imagine what you could learn if you got to interview Napoleon on why he invaded Russia. What would you ask Anatoly <laughs> Dyatlov concerning the Chernobyl explosion? What might you inquire about if you could have coffee with Captain Edward Smith? Join us this fall as we examine history's greatest failures from the very people who lived and breathed those experiences. Let co-hosts Macaulay Culkin and Lindsay Lohan take you on a wild ride down history's crooked path of the worst decisions of all time. Don't miss out season one of Dead Wrong with special guest Clara Hitler launching this Saturday, October 31st. Very nice. Yeah, um, this actually this one. So you might have seen them on Crunchbase quite a bit. They had to go through a lot of rounds of funding, hundreds of millions of dollars for that reanimation process, mm-hmm. just to get the guests. But yeah. I think it's going to be worth it. I've heard inside. Just I, I, we're not technically under an enforceable NDA with them, so I think we're okay to share this. Mm-hmm. I've heard that the George Custer episode is phenomenal because mm-hmm. he still thinks it was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And I, I heard that get gets contentious. And from what I understand, Lindsay Lohan actually crossed the desk and went oh, after wow. him. Yeah. Wow. But I, you know, you'll just have to wait. I don't think that one drops until like December. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, right around Christmas, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome to dead wrong. The podcast. Yep. From your favorite podcast studio. From your favorite from your podcast, podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whichever is yours, that's what produced it. Um, all right, so we've now got video. Um, how can we're you, done. How can we continue? Okay. <laughs> Wherever you listen to podcasts. Bye. Um, so how can you continue to... We're, we're talking about setting up our video team for success. Um now that we've got the video, so many people kind of think that's the end, but then they get there and they realize, well, shit, we haven't put this anywhere. Mm-hmm. Nobody nobody can actually see this yet. Mm-hmm. So how is it actually supposed to fulfill its purpose without putting it mm-hmm. somewhere? Somebody's got to do that. Right. So what, is, what does that process involve and what can you, I mean, do you? To me, it goes back to the comprehensive strategy, kind of having that distribution plan in place right. beforehand. What if you haven't done that? What if you now have this video and you got to figure out where it goes? Well, that's a pretty shitty situation, <laughs> but I mean, it, it happens. <clears throat> so, um, well, I, the, the other option would be that you don't put any plan in place and then nobody puts it anywhere. Yeah. Which sure. is, you know, which is Just a not a, a recipe for success. Um, well, so in this in this area, um, I think the important one of the most important things to have is a is a hosting platform. You need to be able to like. I don't think anybody hosts their own videos anymore, or why they would. Like, if, a, if they are, they're probably like a web developer. I, yeah. I don't know. There are so many good hosting. Maybe platforms a server that, company would do it yeah. to like show off. Yeah, I don't how know. Fast, yeah. Um, but yeah, so you've got to be able to host it, which basically means there's a video, like the video player, and that goes either on a website or another website. <laughs> um, also another website. And another website. Um, but that's that's how you, like YouTube is a hosting site. Mm-hmm. So you could use YouTube. Um, but oftentimes the hosting sites also allow you to share it to different channels mm-hmm. within their platform, which yep. is nice. So you could... You could copy an embed code 
to put on your website. Mm-hmm. You could copy the same embed code to put on another, another website. website. You could copy, um, or, or you could you should, you could select share to Facebook, right. and it will optimize sharing it to Facebook with the post and the call to action that mm-hmm. you want to set. You could share it to LinkedIn, and so it optimizes that video for those platforms. It doesn't upload them natively. Right. If you were to do that, which a lot of those platforms do prefer natively up. Yeah, like video. LinkedIn wants to, wants videos hosted by LinkedIn. Well, and, and have you seen The Social Dilemma mm, on Netflix? Half of it. So what I've always suspected or, or just kind of knew is that platforms don't like you to leave the platforms. Right. Platforms not only don't like you to leave their platform, they want to keep their trying to come up with as many crazy ways as possible to keep you on that platform yep. even if you don't want to be yeah um and so that's why they they want native video so much is because if you embed from your video host um you have the opportunity to click on that and then end up somewhere else right and they don't want you leaving so they'll allow it but that's oftentimes why uh those those kind of embedded options they reward you they reward you for the um, for the live or uh, for the the native embed um, and uploading it to their platform instead of putting it somewhere that's going to drive someone away from that um, that channel. Yep. I um, I didn't buy into all the hype, but I watched the social dilemma, and it is must watch. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. Um, I think every company should have a YouTube channel. Yeah, and that YouTube channel should be set up. Yeah. Don't just start uploading videos and leave it. You've got to title things correctly. Mm-hmm. You've got to pick the right thumbnails. You've even getting down to the point of like, I think you still need to have a hundred subscribers, but once you get a hundred subscribers, you're allowed to create your own URL. Mm-hmm. So it'd be youtube.com slash storyboard media. Fictitious company. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and so, yeah, setting up the playlist, setting up the, like all the metadata in there. <clears throat> Optimizing for SEO. Have your right. SEO analyst go in there and write the descriptions, mm-hmm. you know, or have a copywriter or your scriptwriter go in and write a description, and the SEO person go back through and make sure that it's got all the keywords. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, I think I don't think you need, I don't think you need more than let's say Vidyard for website stuff and YouTube for um, search, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a pretty good start to getting it out there. Where on your site it goes probably depends on the type of content that it is. I mean, again, should have been decided on weeks or months ago in the uh, strategy spot. But if you're just at this point now uh, and, and you want to set your team up for success, you got to find the right page. So based on the content that's there, based on your audience, you know, your viewers, is the viewer able to take action immediately following that video? Is yeah. there a button, a buy button or whatever it is below the video player or even in the video player. Um, so knowing what you want that, that, um, that viewer to do and enabling them to do that on that web page is an important part. Yeah. And I, I mean, if, as we've kind of, you know, cobbled this, this theoretical hypothetical, um, example, as we've gone on here, if it's, if it's mitigating risk, if it's social proof type content, um, your website is probably loosely designed on that customer journey. And so you know which page or pages they're visiting when they're they're like they're sold on decision, the platform, it yeah. can work for them, but they, like, had a demo. they just need to Yeah, right. So they've but they just need a little bit of, like they're not willing to take the risk like early adopters are. So they just need to hear from other people, this has worked for me, and then they can they can buy. Um, you know which of your pages uh, are optimized for that. So you're not going to take a, a a social proof video and put it above the fold on your on your home page. Mm-hmm. It doesn't belong there. That's where the top of the funnel stuff belongs for people who are just finding out about your brand for the first time. But it's on those pages where somebody who's in that kind of final consideration mm-hmm. deliberation phase um, would go. That's where those things uh, belong. If you I mean, if you make a video and don't distribute it, it's like a tree falling in the forest and nobody hearing it. But if you make a video and put it on the wrong page on your site, nobody's going to find it anyway. It's like the tree. Oh, and, yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's like the tree. I was gonna say, well, I was going to say a tree falling on somebody. Uh, yeah. Cause, cause, yeah. Like if it's on the wrong page. Yeah. Um, another thing that I think 
again, this is just in distribution. We're not even at promotion yet. But um, we can be. Well, one at least one last thing. If you've got a blog or something like that that relates to this content, make sure you go back into that blog and update it and say to see more about mm -hmm. this and then link to your video or link to that page or something because that's just going to create more channels to that video. How do you set your team up for success in the promotion phase? I, to, to me, the both... So to me, distribution is more about putting it in the right place so that the people who need to find it can find it on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and and that helps those people decide to buy. I think you could spin promotion as putting it in front of the people who don't necessarily know to look for it. And need to see it. But still need to see it. And both of those things are kind of setting up analysis. So I, I don't want to jump ahead to analysis, but to truly analyze your content, you've got to have a sample size that's large enough. Mm -hmm. So passively distributing on a landing page or, um, you know, putting it only in one place on your website, something like that. Yes, it may help the people who, who need it at that time find it and it may help them buy. But if you can if you can drive more people to it. Mm hmm. Not only do you help more people buy, but you get more data to analyze. So for me, promotion is understanding. Promotion to me is all about the audience. Mm -hmm. Who is it that's supposed to be watching this and acting on this? Mm -hmm. So for this kind of lower in the funnel stuff, I think a retargeting campaign mm -hmm. would be a fantastic thing to invest yep. in. And, and I think that's the, you know, this, this promotion part is truly an investment. So it's, you know, we talked at the beginning about budget, and this is one of those areas where you want to have budget mm -hmm. available to it helps even if it's a small budget. Um, but but promotion is much you know promotion is possible by you know organically by using the right tags, hashtags, titles, descriptions, uh, you know, social uploads, those kinds of things. It, it can find some of the right people with the right hashtags if they're. Um, following that's kind of a passive promotion thing. Active promotion then would be going into those platforms, doing a boosted post or a, a sponsored post, mm -hmm. where you're actually picking the um, the qualifiers of your audience. Who do you want to target this to? Who do you want to spend this money mm -hmm. getting this in front of? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that's where if you don't have a clear understanding of those personas that this video was made for, or better yet, it, it since you had a better understanding of the persona or personas that this was made for, you then get to take that information, fill in yep. all of those blanks yep. on who you want to target this to. Yep. Geographically, job title, you know, companies, wh whatever mm -hmm. it may be. If you've got an ABM approach, selecting specific companies, yep. uh, spe selecting specific people yep. within those companies yep. that you know are at a certain part um, of this process. It's it's about getting it to those people so that you understand that people who need that information, how they interact with. Yeah. Um, to me, that's almost as a video creator, as a marketer, that's almost more valuable to me than the potential revenue that it gets the company closer to. You can't ignore that. Right. So so there's there's. Yes, you can get more people the information they need to then click buy mm -hmm. and actually become a customer. But there's just, I don't know, inherently there's so much more value in that additional data on those larger sample sizes of the people who are intended to see this, what they do with it. Yeah. Do they act? Yep. Do they rewatch? Do they watch do they share? the whole thing do multiple they times? Do they share? Do they, what do they do with it? Mm -hmm. Or what don't they do with it? That then leads into analysis, which is basically what do we learn from this and, <clears throat> and what do we do next time? And let's not forget, like, well... It does help to have a budget in promotion, but you don't have to pay always for promotion. Um, one one simple way, especially this type of video that we're, we've we brought up in this situation, it's helping them make a decision, right? They're maybe closer to a decision phase. Um, they're probably in touch with the salesperson. That sales the person that salesperson should make an effort to get that content in front of those buyers. Yeah. And so using email or I've even seen some companies, especially to like C-level, um, you know, executives uh, sending a 
programmed, uh, preloaded, uh, like iPad or something to them because you're almost ensured that they're going to watch it. Mm-hmm. If you got an iPad in the, ma- in the mail and turned it on, it said like, hey, this is from Ben at StoryWare Media. I'd probably watch it and just, I'd turn it on and then there's a video. I'm going to watch it. Yeah. I am. I think most people would. Um, so different ways, there are different ways of getting it out there that are that are free. Also, just like, you know, email campaigns. Putting it in someone's mailbox is, yes. is is an active form and not a passive form of getting it out there. I would argue that sending somebody an iPad is not free. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, I mean, you may not have to pay for the I forgot video. About, I forgot about postage. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, if you're anything like us, you have ac- the backdoor access to an iPad warehouse. So they don't actually cost anything. Right. Um, and there's so many of them. Are they going to know? Well, that Apple's one of our missing? favorite clients. Sure, I don't think we're even allowed to joke about that. <laughs> um, as a certified professional by Apple, I have at one point in my life read all of the guidelines, and I'm pretty sure we can't claim that if it's not true. So, we'll Apple's print a retraction <laughs> in our um, newsletter this week. Yeah, um, it might actually be a decent tease. The episode. <laughs> turns out they're yeah. not a client. <laughs> turn, turn, turns out we've heard from Apple and turns out we got into a little bit of trouble. So there's a retraction at the end of the episode if you want to go check it out now. What? Um, anything else on pre-promotion paid by pre-promotion. By, by iPads or, uh, uh, or free by iPads? No, but you're right. It's about, I mean, a lot of this is about getting the sample size to inform the next step, which is analysis. Well, and, that, and that's, you know, again, and obviously I think, making revenue, like you said. I think people new to new to video or, or inexperienced with video or maybe hands off with video, like they think that it's, they think that it starts when you hit record. They think that it's done when you've got, you know. It's on your site. Underscore final, right? And yeah. then maybe they think it's done when it's on the site. And, and then maybe they think it's done once they've like finished their 30 day campaign. Mm-hmm. Or something like that. But what's the point besides generating revenue for your company um, and helping your customers? You know, what's the point um, of doing that if you're not going to analyze that data? Because there's so many insights that you can glean. And, and you have to know what to look for. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and a good digital strategist or, or content analyst or, or digital analyst, some, somebody like that, is probably going to be able to, to figure those things out. You could probably, that's something that I think is, you know, a learned type skill. So you could probably, you know, invest some some time for someone on your staff to to learn what does it mean if this, you know, was only watched a third of the way through, Mm -hmm. whereas most of our content is watched 70 percent of the way through. Or what does it mean that this thing, this part of the video got rewatched or this has a much higher share percentage than, than that? I mean. It's often case by case, but but without turning those analytics into insights, you haven't really learned anything. I mean, you could certainly survive that way and then make your next video content, but your next video content is more likely to be more productive and helpful if you take what you learned from the previous ones Mm -hmm. and apply that. Um, And that and, and it's a. I mean, that is the ultimate combination of art and science. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's understanding the numbers to then interpret, you know, what do you learn about your viewer's behavior? Um, what do you learn about the content that you made? Um, where you put it? Um, how you promoted it? Uh, how you distributed it? How you uh, edited it? How you shot it? How you wrote it? I mean, you get to learn about all of those things. And, and especially, I mean, if once you get into you know, learning from those insights, then all of a sudden you get into things like A-B testing, right? Like imagine, it doesn't really work for this scenario, but ima- imagine a, a, a 90 second video and, and you do a male VO versus female VO. Mm-hmm. And the script is exactly the same. The visuals are exactly the same. And you see a higher engagement with the female VO version than the male VO version. Well, you, you potentially just learn something about your audience. Mm-hmm. That they connect Sexist. more with that, yes, that they connect more with that female voice than the male voice. Um, and so then you get to uh, maybe lean more heavily on female voiceover, female hosts going forward with your content. Um, 
there could be you know you could thumbnails do a, in in the, yeah you could do thumbnails um you know and and check play rates mm -hmm. um you could do uh, a three minute version of this customer story and a 45 second version of this customer mm -hmm. story a b test them and maybe you see that that the click through rate to the buy link is higher on the 45 second version because more people made it through more of that and got the message and they still got the message in 45 seconds and they didn't need the three minutes to do mm -hmm. it um, or you see that just as many people We're clicked here for a while clicked buy um 45 seconds into the three minute version sure uh, right yeah. and so then then that's just another data point where this one not only outperformed but they what they acted on less information than they had available to them um, there are others, but I'll stop. <laughs> or, or, yeah. No, I'm joking. I mean, those that, that, some of those I don't even think about either, but they're good examples. Um, Our next bullet point says other things dot, dot, dot. So I'll let you take that one. Um, Setting, yeah, okay, at large. What... Can we do to set our team up for? I mean, we've we've covered all seven phases of practicing effective video for business. Yeah, Th this thing. Is that right? Yep. Right. This Just thing. a little bit up. This, this thing. Th yeah. This there we go. This thing. This oh, thing. There we go. That thing. <clears throat> is there what what else is outside of that that in it involves video? Paying them. <laughs> Yes, pay them hourly salary. You know that's handsomely. really your call. Um, pay them. No, I can't advocate for paying anyone handsomely. Pay them like a dollar more than they need. Because then maybe you could have two of them instead of just one. No, well, you're the manager. You're Mr. Manager. <laughs> I'm Mr. Manager. <laughs> Hello, kids. I'm Mr. Manager. <clears throat> um. I don't know. I mean, there's all kinds of other. I, I we don't say Mister. I could say that. I could say that other things could be filled in by all of our hiring a episodes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's right, a I lot mean, more detail I, I mean, in that. You know, put, putting putting the right team together, putting the right people together, picking the right people for the job. Um, you know, uh, and and I think this comes down to managerial style too. But again, just give them the purpose and let them do their job. Don't micromanage the process um, uh, unless you do have that kind of experience. Right. In which case you can play the role of producer. But, you know, it's probably not a good use of your time in this fictitious managerial position to to micromanage even if you are going to produce a thing. Let your team do what they do and be there for them when they need you. Mm -hmm. Well done, Ben. We did it. We did it. So just to recap... Press rewind. Yeah, just rewind about an hour, <laughs> and then and then watch it back on two x or three x. In 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 yes, insert fast version here. Um, so just to recap, we talked about uh, identifying a firm purpose for each video, giving them time for pre production because ninety percent of a director's job is done before the shoot. Um, giving them the proper production tools, gear, actors, crew, locations, access to those kinds of things. Timely and constructive feedback, um, mm -hmm. offering problems and not solutions during post-production. Uh, having a distribution plan in place and, and executing it. Where's this going? Um, having the right budget for promotion. And then, of course, an analysis tracking your metrics of success. What if you could only do one of those? <laughs> if I could only do one of those, I would identify a firm, a firm purpose for each video. Yeah. Um, because the the why of storyboard media is an evolution from clients who did not have any purpose. They had a video when they hired us for right. for projects, and so we just got so frustrated making videos that that our clients didn't know what they wanted to accomplish or what they were going to do with them. Mainly because it made it really hard for us to go back and ask for another project because the first one didn't succeed because they didn't know why they were making it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to take their money, but I'm not happy to not have access to more of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not happy that they didn't find success with, but I mean, you know, that's kind of, 
you know, where the first seeds of what we are now as a mm-hmm. video agency mm-hmm. were is like, well, okay, you don't have you don't have a, a reason for making this and, mm-hmm. and let us help you find that purpose. And the projects where <clears throat> we do have a purpose, whether it's given or imposed, they're a lot more fun and rewarding. Yeah. Because you can there's a there's a measuring stick and you get to say we did it or we didn't, and at right. least we learned something. Yes. Yeah. I, you know, and, and I even think back about a recent project that, that we did where we had to reshoot. Um, it was easy when we put the first edit together to look at what we were trying to do and know immediately that we hadn't done that. And if we had just, you know, wanted to make a video, I think it would have been easier for someone to say, well, yeah, this works. But it was just so far from what our intended purpose was. Mm-hmm. Uh, we knew that it was something that missed the mark and we had to we had to you know, go back, not all the way to the drawing board, but we had to (laughs) go back to the drawing board and and figure out how to do it and, you know, stick with that purpose and that project out there. Let's hear from our sponsor one more time. Imagine what you could learn if you got to interview Napoleon and why he invaded Russia. What would you ask Anatoly (laughs) Dyatlov concerning the Chernobyl explosion? I think it's Dyatlov, but that's Dyatlov. Uh, what might you inquire about if you could have coffee with Captain Edward Smith? Do you know what he did? I don't. I was just about to look him up. He crashed the Titanic. Ah, uh, yes. Join us this fall as we examine history's greatest failures from the very people who lived and breathed those experiences. Let co-hosts Macaulay Culkin and Lindsay Lohan take you on a wild ride down history's crooked path of the worst decisions of all time. Don't miss season one of Dead Wrong with special guest Clara Hitler launching this Saturday, October 31st. All right. Well, that is it for this episode of the Video Reformation Podcast. Thanks so much for watching, listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe and all the things that you do and all the places where you watch and listen to podcasts and blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah. This is episode 39. We're almost we're almost over the hill. We're almost 40. Yeah. I am 40. Yeah, but as a podcast. Right. The music played us out by now? Yeah. Yeah, I think the music has already played us up by now.